Our guest today is the Commissioner of the Department of Transportation. He was appointed Commissioner almost two years ago. His goal is to make Chicago an example nationally for innovation in trans transportation in public space for the 2.6 million residents of Chicago. Prior to his appointment by Mayor Rahm Emanuel, our guest today served as director of the District of Columbia Department of Transportation. He earned, he earned a degree in marketing management from Virginia Tech. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back to the City Club of Chicago, Commissioner Gabe Klein. Gabe. Thank you, Jay. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming out today. Let me get situated. Um, I did just walk in the bike lane, Dr. Green. Hope that's okay. <laughs> um, so last year when I was here, I was pretty long-winded. I think I took like 40 minutes. So I'm going to try to uh, give people an update a little bit quicker. Um, when I did speak last time, we talked a lot about what Mayor Emanuel's vision was for the city. And it was a pretty expansive uh, vision and roadmap. And I think we had just either put out or we're getting ready to put out our two-year plan for the agency. So the mayor has these you know, concrete steps that he wants us to take in terms of construction, great public spaces, safer streets, and support for neighborhood and global business. I apologize. I wonder if I have a cell phone on me. Nope. just getting worse and worse. Uh, but before I get started, I just want to acknowledge that uh, we're almost at the two-year mark for, for the administration. So um, we've come a long way, and we've come a long way quickly. But we couldn't do it without many of you in this room. So you know, I'm sort of the person that carries out the mayor's vision. But without the consultants, without the utilities, um, uh, without an incredible staff that we have, the advocacy organizations, uh, all of you, we couldn't have gotten all this work done so quickly. And we have a lot more coming up in 2013. But I do just want to uh, thank all the CDOT folks that came out today. If they could just stand up, we can give them a little recognition. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about where we were, where we are, and where we're going. I love to show these old pictures when I start these presentations because they give a sense of how congested and complicated things have always been in a city this size. Um, this is rush hour in the 1920s. We always had a lot of pedestrians in the city and cyclists in, in the city. And there was a time when we actually had fewer vehicles. We've always been a very multimodal city, including the horse and buggy back in the day. Streetcars. We had one of the largest streetcar networks in the country. And now, uh, we're still very multimodal. We still have a lot of people walking and biking and taking transit and, of course, driving. So I'm going to start out by talking a little bit about some of our major initiatives, including the Building a New Chicago initiative and one of the key projects that many of you have probably seen may have uh, been a little bit of a pain, which is the Wells Street Bridge. But before we get there, let's talk again a little bit about the infrastructure in Chicago. This is amazing. This is 1907, and look at it now. Minus a change to the crosswalk, it's not really that much different, is it? But we are modernizing. This is the, uh, the Morgan Street Station, which went away, I believe, in 1948, and we just put back. And we're going to talk more about that later. We have these wonderful bascule bridges, just gorgeous. And we've always had a, a healthy um, tourism business. If you look closely, it says daily excursions to the drainage canal. So that was, that was a real tourist attraction back in the day. Now we're going to have the river walk, which I'll talk more about later. Um, but we do have this old infrastructure. Much of it is either 50 or 100 years old. It was either built around the turn of the last century or in the 50s when Eisenhower put together the big highway bill. Uh, much of it came together. Um, in this picture, you can actually see the south leaf 
uh, for the Well Street Bridge that we put in place just a few weeks ago. And as we were driving over here, we saw the north leaf actually getting clicked into place. Uh, this is a huge, huge project. There's like 63 people working around the clock, 12-hour shifts, of course. We, we don't want them working 24 hours a day. Uh, and five, this is a 500,000-pound piece of steel. Why is this so complicated? Well, you've got train traffic up above. And th th this is one of only two bridges in uh, Chicago like this. Then you've got bike, ped, bus, and car traffic. And then you've got maritime traffic underneath. And the bridge has to be able to accept boats right now while we're under construction. So I'm going to, instead of talking, I'm going to show you guys a little video. When you see big pieces of machinery and big pieces of bridges literally floating up and down and getting cut off, you don't see that too often. That's something that's uh, pretty historic. So many people have been on this bridge in the last nine days and round the clock and despite the long, long hours that everybody's put in, everybody's still been able to communicate and work to get it done. We're at the Well Street Bridge. We're out here doing a major structural overhaul. We're replacing the river arm of both leaves all over the portion over the water and it's to provide the bridge with another, say, 50 years of service life. The bridge was originally constructed in 1922, so it's 91 years old. It's at the end of its service life, and it was time for a major rehab. There's just a lot of deterioration on the structure, and um, we took this opportunity to replace it and come up with a new structure that's a replication of the old one. This is about building a new Chicago. In the next three years, we're putting 30,000 people to work throughout the city building our roads, our bridges, our airport, our water system, our schools, our community colleges, and our parks. And this is a dramatic piece of that infrastructure investment. The city of Chicago is leading the country in that effort of investing in literally from light poles to potholes and everything between it. The construction value is $41 million. There's an additional $5 million of costs on there as well. It's funded through the Federal Highway Administration and the Illinois Department of Transportation. It's those funds that have made this project possible. This is about one of the most challenging jobs anybody's worked on. As I said, this is the most complex and challenging job we've ever done. With that, we take great pride in what we do. Uh, we embrace the challenge, but at the same time, everybody's focus is on getting the task done at hand. There's a tremendous amount of prep work that goes into this. You have to go through the whole preliminary engineering study figure out the logistics, the staging, how we're going to do it. One of the key aspects of this project is the uh, elevated transit service, uh, service on the upper level of the bridge. We knew that was going to be an issue from day one. We staged the whole project around keeping that closure to an absolute minimal. The contractor had the portion of the south leaf of the truss pre-assembled off-site. Uh, we were giving a nine-day shutdown by the CTA in order to minimize the impacts, so we had to do as much repair as we could in those nine days. Friday night, once the last CTA train went over, the north leaf of the bridge was raised. Crew started to pre prepare the demo for the portion of the south leaf that was cut. Saturday evening, they just cut around uh, what's called panel point 10 and, thir and 13 above on the truss and literally just torched that portion off. It was floated away onto a barge and on, on shoring towers off to the side. Monday afternoon, new portion was floated up and connected onto the existing bridge. The work that's been happening ever since then has been the track work up top and doing the balancing and the steel work on the lower level of the bridge. Everybody who's working on this project is taking great pride in the fact that they're associated with this project, the fact that they can tell their family and friends that, yeah, I worked on this. All the men and women in the trades working on it take great pride in it. Pretty amazing. I mean, CDOT's done a lot of work, including this one, that you really can't do anywhere else. So I'm very fortunate to be able to work on, especially these movable bridges. The infrastructure projects like this are, are critical. It's a joint cooperation between the city of Chicago and the Chicago Transit Authority. By combining projects, we were able to realize some real synergies, a half million dollars to savings and also eight weekend closures that didn't have to happen. And it's all part of the building a new Chicago plan that happens under our leadership from Mayor Ronald Emanuel. So you get the idea. I also want to thank uh, the Walsh 2-in-1 Joint Venture for just doing a phenomenal job 
uh, on this project thus far. And we'll have everything open. We're forecasting for uh, the CTA next uh, Sunday late or Monday morning. So now we're going to move on and talk a little bit about placemaking in Chicago. According to Wikipedia, placemaking is a multifaceted approach to the planning, design, and management of public spaces. And I often uh, say that we're the, the Department of Public Space and Transportation. We have about a quarter of the city's uh, land mass, if you will. And so we have a lot of responsibility to stimulate economic growth and create livable places. I don't think anything embodies this more than the Bloomingdale Trail, uh, which has been on the books in planning uh, since 1998. And when the mayor came in, he really, he really prioritized this and said, we're going to get this thing done. And uh, within a few months, we had a financial plan. Uh, we worked with Trust for Public Lands, who's done a, a great job with the Park District of planning gateway parks. This will be a 2.7, or it's actually 2.65 mile elevated park on an old uh, a Canadian Pacific line that, that was abandoned. And uh, it'll actually be the longest elevated trail in the world. Um, here's what it looks like now. Not that attractive. Some people are actually already out there running on it. Uh, we're going to transform it. Uh, we have 37 viaducts, uh, bridge structures, if you will, that have to be uh, secured, uh, heavied up. And then we've got um, uh, just a whole lot of track that needs to be taken out, trees that need to be planted. It's going to really be beautiful when it's done, though. Uh, here's another before and after picture. So the mayor always stresses this is an active use trail. So unlike the High Line, and how many of you have, have been to the High Line? OK. So I always joke, this is nothing like the High Line. The High Line is, is a beautiful park in the sky. Uh, this is going to be an active use trail for the seven neighborhoods uh, that touch this rail line. Um, again, uh, there are gateway parks that are being planned, some of which have actually already been built. Uh, and here's the western trailhead, uh, which is going to be just beautiful. So that'll go to construction. I think it's out to bid now. We'll go to construction this summer. And we aim to have it done in August of 2014. Pretty fast. Another beautiful public space is the Chicago Riverwalk. Um, this year is an extremely complex project that started under Mayor Daley. I believe the first two and a half blocks uh, were completed by about 2005, six. And um, we looked at this project and we said, you know, how could we finish the remaining six blocks? It's about a 75 to $100 million project. So the team went to work. Uh, Sasaki, Carol Ross Barney, and many other firms, some of which are in this room, worked on, on the design for this. And we thought, how could we transform it and make it beautiful? Um, we have been awarded, uh, well, we are going to be closing, we hope, on a uh, TIFIA loan, a federal loan. We're the first people in line uh, when they put out the new MAP 21 transportation bill. Um, they actually, by a factor of 10, expanded that TIFIA loan program. What's significant about TIFIA loans is it allows you to borrow basically at the overnight treasury rate, which is somewhere around 3%. I think it's a little bit higher now, maybe 3.2. Um, 35 year term, it's a very, very good loan for the city. Um, so the Secretary of Transportation was in town just a few weeks ago and announced that we did qualify for the loan. We hope to go to closing, as I said, in June. Um, and we could be in the ground actually working to build this this year. Um, so here's State to Dearborn. You can see there's some beautiful graffiti and a nice fence. Um, we want to transform that into the, the Marina Plaza. Uh, this will have a restaurant and retail, uh, beautiful seating areas, and steps down right to the, to the Chicago River. Um, you can see also that we're going to be building 25 feet out. So now, when you're up at Wacker, you look over the edge, you actually see that there's something going on down there. Right now, when you look down there, you don't see anything. And so the businesses that have been down there have had a hard time. Here's Dearborn to Clark, another pretty block. This is going to be the Cove, a uh, lot of active transportation. Um, you'll have kayaking, you'll have uh, water taxis, so on and so forth. LaSalle to Wells, the swimming hole, uh, which will have a water feature for children, more retail. Clark to LaSalle, the river theater. This will break down that vertical barrier between Wacker and the river. Again, have water taxis, some small performance space, ADA ramp accessibility, and so on. 
Wells to Franklin. This will be the jetty. It'll have CPS classrooms. You can have special events. It'll have floating gardens, fishing, and will be really focused on educating kids on ecology. And then the last block is double the size, Franklin to Lake. This we're using uh, to store stuff from the Wacker Drive project. <laughs> Not the highest and best use for your waterfront. Um, this, we're actually going out 50 feet instead of 25. And I should have mentioned, one of the most significant parts of this project is that every uh, block will be connected now via an under, uh, under bridge connector. Um, but this one is going to take uh, more to do. So we have a very conceptual uh, design at this point, uh, which we're going to refine. Uh, you can even see there's some food trucks up there on top. And uh, another project that we're working on, which has been on the books for a while, is a Navy Pier flyover, which is going out to bid in the next month. How many people ride on the Lakefront Trail? All right, about half. That's great. Uh, some of you probably don't because it gets so congested around Navy Pier that it's frustrating or you feel like it's not safe. So we're going to build this flyover um, that is going to you know, really transform people's ride uh, through the loop area by Navy Pier. Um, and then I, I'm just going to keep going because i got so much to, uh, to talk about. We also have our Make Way for People program, which is our tactical urbanism program. And I think we have the Lakeview Chamber of Commerce here uh, who's had some wonderful people spots. I think we'll have a picture of those and is going to do a really cool one this year with lighting from underneath that shines up and all kinds of cool stuff and a, a sculpture. Um, these are low-cost ways to transform public space, particularly public space that's underutilized. So we have people spot streets, plazas, and alleys. Um, this is an example of what they look like. Here's Lincoln Ave and Andersonville. Uh, also, um, we've got them down south in Bronzeville. We have two pilots from last summer. These were parking spaces that were transformed. And just so you know, we did find alternative parking spaces so that uh, there was no issue with last. And I'm going to show a little video that will give you a better sense of these. Make Way for People is sort of an umbrella program that has four sub-programs underneath it. There are people spots, and people streets, people plazas, and people alleys. And we're providing people more space where they often don't have it on uh, sidewalks that are often narrow, in plazas that are underutilized. And this is one of four pilots this summer. We have one in Lakeview, one in Andersonville, and two in Bronzeville. Before we launch a full-fledged program, next summer, which will have plazas, alleys, spots, and streets, not just these uh, parking spots. This is really about us opening up opportunities to partner with the community to do things that they already want to do, and to open their eyes to some of the possibilities of placemaking and how it can improve the economics of a community, the walkability of the community, and therefore the health of the community, and tying all of these things together. We knew that if we built something like this that was new and unique and user-friendly, that it would draw people to the area and therefore increase foot traffic and awareness of the businesses that are here. It just it creates something different and unique, and it's new to Chicago, which everyone is going to be interested in, we hope. Yeah. So it's pretty user-friendly, I think. We want to promote people just walk down the street, take a walk in your neighborhood. So whether you're walking to a coffee shop or to ZNH up the street, they may take a break sit down, enjoy the weather. And so the rationale behind ours was to help to stimulate that walkability, promote that safety with getting more eyes on the street because more people are comfortable with walking. It's great for business. It provides an active space in the community, which is good for public safety, and it beautifies. I mean, this is absolutely beautiful. And this is on par with something you would see downtown in Millennium Park. The thing, of course, that's really important to know about people spots and everything within the Make Way for People program is it's for the public. These spots build off of things that are positive things that are happening in the community, but they're for everyone, and we hope that everyone will come and enjoy them. All right, so you get the idea. Now here's some before and after shots, 47th and Greenwood. That was an underutilized space. They actually planted vegetables out there. Uh, here's, a, here's Andersonville before, after. So basically, we're supporting culture, community, and economic development uh, with this project. Let's talk about Complete Streets Chicago. Some of you may know we just put out our, our new Complete Streets guidelines about a week and a half ago. And we've already gotten some national uh, recognition at the APA conference that was here in Chicago as well. Mm -hmm. 
Um, we're very proud of this document because it's going to guide for the next few decades how we redesign our city in favor of people, uh, in favor of people that live in the city in particular. Mm -hmm. There's our complete streets policy, which you've actually had on the books since 2006. But we looked and we said, you know, driving's down. People are driving a lot less. It peaked around uh, between 1997 and 2004, around 8.2 billion, has fallen steadily to just over 7 0.2 billion miles traveled in 2011, which actually parallels national data around the country. And we know that people love living in the city because they don't have to necessarily keep one car or two cars or three cars, uh, and that they have other options and they can live, work, and play in one area. So our complete streets uh, design guidance says that our baseline mode hierarchy should put the pedestrian first, because the pedestrian is also the person riding the bus. When he gets off his bike or her bike, he, he or she is a pedestrian. And when you get out of your car, you're a pedestrian. So the pedestrian comes first. We want to encourage people to take transit. We want to encourage people to use active transportation and bike. And then we want to give people the option to take their car when they need to. And so when you look at it, we've had to divide uh, the street up into the, the pedestrian realm, the roadway, and then, de then the interstitial area, which is where the bike lanes are and the curbs and the turning lanes and so on and so forth. And here's an example of a complete street cross section. And so this, uh, this complete streets Chicago guideline is actually part of a family of documents that we've put out over the last two years, starting with, with the Chicago Forward Agenda, the pedestrian plan, the Complete Streets Plan, and the Chicago Streets for Cycling Plan 2020, which builds on the 2015 plan that was put out a number of years ago, which um, really went into the, the how are we going to do this, whereas the Streets for Cycling Plan 2020 actually lays out a particular map of treatments throughout the city. We spent a year actually working with people all, uh, all across the city in every neighborhood, um, and this complements our PED plan. We identified 645 miles of on-street bike routes. Now, Mayor Daly was an avid cyclist, and there were already 116 miles of bikeways in the city, plus the trails and all of that. So we've built on the strength of his legacy, and we're already up over 200 miles, including a lot of new uh, protected bike lanes, which actually physically separate people. Um, but one thing that's important to remember, Dr. Green, there's a rich history of cycling in Chicago. Uh, around the turn of the last century, Chicago was actually the capital of the world in terms of cycling. Um, and there were over 200 companies making uh, cycling-related goods, bikes, and so on. There's an ad there for the Crescent from Western Wheel Works at 501 North Wells Street, actually. Um, and right now, SRAM Corp is here in the city. They're the number two uh, supplier of bike components in the world. I think they're a $650 million company. So that rich history continues. And we have more people biking than, than New York City or LA. Now when we looked into it, we found that most people were not the lycra-clad folks. They weren't the hipsters riding the fixies down Milwaukee Ave, although we're building for those folks too. But it's more people in this room that might wear a suit every day or a skirt and want to ride their bike, but they don't feel safe. Um, and so the mayor said that he wanted Chicago to be the bike friendliest city in the country. And he didn't just say it, he stood behind it. Uh, this is an example of a, a bike lane on the south side by University of Chicago. Now when we dug a little bit further, a lot of people said, well, I work downtown and I would love to ride, but it is crazy downtown if you're on a bike. You feel like you're gonna get hit by a car. So you look at Dearborn, for instance, which had too much capacity, 8,000 cars a day, capacity for about 25,000. People were speeding. And we put in a bike facility, a two-way bike facility, and traffic is flowing just fine. It's actually flowing better because we cleaned up some signal issues. We put, put in new signals, put in sensors for the cars, put in um, uh, bike signals, and we're also finding that the bikers are obeying the rules, which I know is a complaint. I'm going to preempt that question, Paul. Um, we know that bikers sometimes don't uh, obey the rules because they're used to not having a place to be. They're not supposed to be in the sidewalk. When they're in the street, they get yelled at by people speeding in cars. When you give them their own space, give them their own signals, sensors, and so on, it works. 
Now these sensors, by the way, uh, the majority of them are in turn lanes, so they let the, uh, well, they actually trigger the uh, signal for a car, and so if there's not a car in the turn lane, then the signalization is, the phasing is different. But we also are testing sensors for the bikes. So when the bike is heading down towards Polk and it runs over that sensor, it can flip that signal uh, and know that a bike is present. And then, of course, bridges. Uh, many of you have probably ridden over those Chicago bridges when they're wet. They can be dangerous, so we're upgrading all the bridge treatments as well. Now, one of the things that I'm a, a big uh, a proponent of, and, and Jay didn't mention this, but I came from four years at Zipcar before I uh, joined government in Washington, D.C., is the sharing economy, the rise of this uh, uh, collaborative consumption model where a car sits on average 93% of the time, 92.8, I think, uh, and um, that's just a lazy asset that's not being used very well. So whether it's car sharing or bike sharing or ride sharing or the bus, which is sharing also, things are changing. And people uh, want different things. They don't necessarily want to own a car anymore if they can share one that 7% of the time that they need it. So part of our job in government is not just to provide these new services for people, but it's actually to enable the private sector to come with solutions, like get around, uh, which allows people to rent their own cars out to other people. So you can have a car and share it with 20, 30 other people. It's Airbnb, uh, same sort of thing. Um, and so sometimes our job is to get out of the way. Now, there's also public-private partnerships. Our new bike share system, we just released the name last week. It's called Divi. Who knows what Divi means? Anybody? Ron Burke. What does it mean? Divvy it up. Divvy it up. Divide and share. That's correct. Um, we wanted it to have a hip, cool brand. We work with IDEO, who actually invented the Apple Mouse, amongst other things, uh, and were featured on 60 Minutes recently. So we picked a world-class firm. But we also wanted it to be Chicago and Chicago Blue. I'll show you what it looks like in just a minute. But let's talk about what bike share is. Bike share is not a bike rental system. It's not this sort of kitschy fun thing, although it is fun. But it's actually a new transit system. It's probably the biggest, not dollar-wise, but the biggest transit investment we'll make in Chicago in terms of changing the way people move since the subway was put in. And I know some of you might not believe me, but who's been to Paris and seen Valive or London and seen the Barclays system? then you probably know how it can drastically change the way people get around, particularly for that last mile. We're going to be launching one of the biggest systems in the country. Uh, right now, Washington, D.C., where I came from, actually has the largest system at about 1,800 uh, bikes right now. We're going to have 4,000 bikes. They're going to start rolling out uh, in the middle of June of this year. Uh, and then, then we'll be on par with Montreal. Uh, New York is going to launch, actually, it's come down to about 6,000 bikes with a goal of getting up to 10,000. Um, here's, the, uh, here's where it's going to start, uh, Devon in the north, California in the west, 63rd on the south, but that's just a start. Um, that's what we're going to do in the first year. The system can grow to cover the entire city over time if people use it. Here's how it works. You can either get a one-day pass or you can get a yearly membership. Then you just grab a bike, you put your key fob in, you ride, you return. If it's less than 30 minutes, you don't pay anything uh, above and beyond that membership fee and then repeat. And here's what the bike will look like. Uh, with a nod to the Chicago blue from the flag, uh, we're going to have the four stars on there. And then the V symbol is also the Shero symbol for a shared lane for bikes. And it also has lights built in. And you can wear a suit or you can wear a skirt and not get anything dirty. Uh, if we had this, I would have rode my bike over here today instead of jumping in a van with everybody because it's a beautiful day, 70 degrees, and I guarantee most of you will too once you see it. Here's the pricing. This will be, and, and I joke, cheaper than walking. For 75 bucks, you can get an annual membership and ride it every single day without spending any more money. And if you walk every single day as I do, you'll probably go through two or three pairs of shoes, so it'll be cheaper. <laughs> Here's what a key fob will look like. And here's what a station looks like. These are solar powered, modular, mobile. We can move them. If there's a special event like Lollapalooza, we can drop more of them out there. Uh, so there's no electric bill. There's no driver to pay. There's no union. No offense to unions. We love unions. But there's no union in this case to, to deal with. And so it's a very simple program. 
and therefore low cost and it makes money. And we let the public choose where the stations went. So we crowdsourced this uh, with help from our chief technology officer here, John Tova, and uh, we let the public pick where they go. We're gonna keep moving uh, and talk about some of the other work that we're doing on new CTA stations. The Morgan Street Station, which I continue to brag about even though it's been there for, gosh, I don't know, almost a year now, is absolutely beautiful. Um, and uh, actually this month, it's on the cover of Architect Magazine. And the title is Infrastructure of Hope, which I think is great. And it's helping to revitalize that neighborhood, which was already well on its way. But with this type of investment, it'll happen that much faster. It'll be that much bolder of a change. This is the big one that's coming, and you're the first to see these pictures. This is the, Sur the Surmac uh, uh, McCormick Place station. Um, when I showed it to, to the mayor, he said, very IIT-ish. <laughs> <laughs> Which it is. Um, here's uh, at ground level what it looks like. And notice it's going to be completely covered and protected from the elements, but let in light. So let's talk about bus rapid transit. Um, there's been a lot in the news about that. Uh, CTA announced last week the preferred alternative for Ashland. Um, this is, I, I love this picture. This is from 1969 uh, from the uh, Transport for London folks. And they recognized a long time ago that there was a problem if everybody chose to drive their car by themselves at the same time. You end up with what you have at the top there. So there's the same people in the cars on foot, and there's all of them on the bus. So the bus is a very efficient way to move people. And what we want to do is make the bus faster, easier, um, and add technology to it to make it something that people want to do just like they love rail. It's going to look and feel like rail. Traffic signal uh, priority is very important, so it gives the green to the bus, and I'm going to show you a video that shows how this works. And um, this is the uh, center running option that was chosen. Uh, again, it's going to look and feel like rail, dedicated bus lane, and will speed up the bus up to 83%. The train goes on average 18 miles an hour. We think we can get the bus up to 17 miles an hour and link all of the major rail lines north-south on Ashland. It has one of the highest uh, bu bus riderships with 10 million boardings in 2012. And there's also 134,000 jobs in that area. So I'm going to show you. I might cut this a little bit short based on time.
keeping people healthy. Um, costs very little in general uh, to maintain. And so it's something that we want to encourage. And, and as such, I would say it's not that we want to subsidize it, but we just don't want to charge more than it costs to operate. Um, so I think that's my answer. So no sticker, no licenses, they just could use the streets that everyone else is paying for. Well, you know, I spent, and, and this wasn't highlighted in my uh, bio, but I spent most of my career in the private sector. So I'm, I'd like less regulation, less bureaucracy. I think it's the same answer I gave two years ago. All right, good enough. <laughs> good enough. And he doesn't want to announce that the city will be reducing the city sticker price for all automobiles because based on uh, usage. <laughs> <laughs> and you want to know why Mayor Emanuel doesn't show up at the City Club. Okay. Charlie Mangini, President, Vandercook College of Music. What are your plans to address the problem of pedestrians not following, don't walk lights, and chronic jaywalking? No respect, not our guy. Jaywalking as just generally walking across the street. Yeah. Uh, good question, and it's a serious problem. Uh, when I was in Washington, a lady was running with her headphones on ran off the curb on New York Avenue right into the wheels of a dump truck and was killed. This kind of thing happens. Um, distracted uh, driving, walking, and biking are a problem. It's more of a problem when you're behind the wheel of a you know, 3,500 pound vehicle for other people. Uh, but for people's own safety, they've got to be more careful. And so our education campaigns and our right-of-way improvements that we're making uh, in terms of our re-engineering of the streets are aimed at getting people to obey the laws. Uh, more signalization, better striping, uh, more education, letting people know that they're risking their lives if they're, they walk out in traffic with a phone. You'll see our PED uh, safety campaign come back this year with less of a focus on cars and more of a focus on people themselves taking responsibility. Three questions. Uh, Skinny Sheehan, great news. I want I wanted to report that I actually saw a cyclist on Durborn Street today. <laughs> is that the question? You're at, Can I answer that? You're at the city club, mister. This is uh, not the executive club. Yeah. There are a lot of anonymous questions. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, so one of the things that, that we're trying to do uh, is we're trying to build the facilities, but also put the bike sharing in at the same time versus spending years and years building the facilities and then putting in the bike sharing. For those of you that are asking the question, it's not, it's not a, a dumb question. You know, so you put in Dearborn in December, why'd you do it in December instead of May, and how come it's not filled with people every day? Well, I bet you actually within a couple weeks it'll be filled every day anyway. But when bike share comes, you're gonna see bikes everywhere. And it's gonna help. It's not gonna cause more of a problem. It's gonna help because the cars are gonna start to slow down a little bit, and they're gonna start to behave a little bit differently. I've seen it in other cities. And it's just sort of the way the world works. Good answer, I'm sure. Skinny or appreciative of that answer, I'm sure of it. Uh, because this is the, we, we operate under the Candy Crowley system of fairness. Uh, <laughs> crowd's a little slow, they just got their RFPs and they don't give a damn about what anything else. Okay, <laughs> Peter Scosi, I find it remarkable that people complain about the occasional bike running a stop sign. Hmm. But never mention the hundreds of cars that speed every day. Don't you? <laughs> I just read um, them, everybody. I, I think we should have a celebrity boxing match between Peter and Skinny Sheehan. So, uh, no, just kidding. Um, I think that um, everybody needs to obey the laws more. Uh, including cyclists. And I think it's amazing when we put the infrastructure in place that makes them feel like they have their own signals in space and that they do obey the laws. So um, we're going to keep working on getting everybody to do that. And we will have a, a cyclist safety campaign coming out this spring as well aimed at cyclists. Okay. Gabe, I, I, you got two more short questions, and I'm, you're doing a great job, by the way. John Wirtz, Jacobs Engineering. When will I be able to divvy, by the way, there's only one V or two Vs in divvy? Two Vs. Hmm. When will I be able to divvy to city club lunches? Yes. Um, you're going to start to see them pop up late, well, mid to late June uh, throughout River North and the Loop, and then expand out there throughout uh, the 32 square miles that I showed earlier. Okay. Last question. And I always have to leave the sandbag for last, though, the opening poem. Perhaps someone could classify that as a sandbag. 
Gray and Grady, Shevsky and Froelich, driving may be down, but is car ownership, off-street parking requirements, should they be adjusted? Mm. You know, that's a great question. I don't know if uh, car ownership is down here. I know in Washington, where I came from over a decade, uh, the city started to grow a lot uh, later in the 2000s and car ownership fell. So the city was growing at a rate of 3% and car ownership fell, uh, car registrations fell by 6%. I think we will see that here, but I don't have the stats here. But we are working with uh, the, the Department of Housing and Economic Development on uh, some changes to the zoning code uh, so that de uh, the developers do not have to build more parking than people actually want. How about a big round of applause? Thank you. Thank you. I hope you take this damn poem. Oh, yeah. Thanks for the poem. <laughs> and he doesn't want to announce that the city will be reducing the city sticker price for all automobiles because based on uh, usage. <laughs> <laughs> and you want to know why Mayor Emanuel doesn't show up at the city club. Okay. Charlie Mangini, president, Vandercook College of Music. What are your plans to address the problem of pedestrians not following, don't walk lights, and chronic jaywalking? No respect. Not our guy, jaywalking as just generally walking across the street. Yeah. Uh, good question, and it's a serious problem. Uh, when I was in Washington, a lady was running with her headphones on, ran off the curb on New York Avenue right into the wheels of a dump truck and was killed. This kind of thing happens. Um, distracted uh, driving, walking, and biking are a problem. It's more of a problem when you're behind the wheel of a you know, 3,500-pound vehicle for other people. Uh, but for people's own safety, they've got to be more careful. And so our education campaigns and our right-of-way improvements that we're making uh, in terms of our re-engineering of the streets are aimed at getting people to obey the laws. Uh, more signalization, better striping, uh, more education, letting people know that they're risking their lives if they're, they walk out in traffic with a phone. You'll see our PED uh, safety campaign come back this year with less of a focus on cars and more of a focus on people themselves taking responsibility. Three questions. Uh, Skinny Sheehan, great news. I, want, I wanted to report that I actually saw a cyclist on Dearborn Street today. <laughs> is that the question? You're at, Can I answer that? You're at the city club, mister. This is uh, not the executive club. Yeah. There are a lot of anonymous questions. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, so one of the things that, that we're trying to do uh, is we're trying to build the facilities but also put the bike sharing in at the same time versus spending years and years building the facilities and then putting in the bike sharing. For those of you that are asking the question, it's not, it's not a, a dumb question. You know, so you put in Dearborn in December, why did you do it in December instead of May? And how come it's not filled with people every day? Well, I bet you actually within a couple of weeks it'll be filled every day anyway. But when bike share comes, you're going to see bikes everywhere. And it's going to help. It's not going to cause more of a problem. It's going to help because the cars are going to start to slow down a little bit and they're going to start to behave a little bit differently. I've seen it in other cities and it's just sort of the way the world works. Good answer. I'm sure Skinny are appreciative of that answer. I'm sure of it. Uh, because this is the, we, we operate under the Candy Crowley system of fairness. Uh, <laughs> crowd's a little slow. They just got their RFPs and they don't give a damn about what anything else. Okay. <laughs> Peter Scosi, I find it remarkable that people complain about the occasional bike running a stop sign. Hmm. But never mention the hundreds of cars that speed every day. Don't you? <laughs> I just read um, them, everybody. I, I think we should have a celebrity boxing match between Peter and Skinny Sheehan. A, uh, no, I'm just kidding. Um, I think that um, everybody needs to obey the laws more, uh, including cyclists. And I think it's amazing when we put the infrastructure in place that makes them feel like they have their own signals in space and that they do obey the laws. So um, we're going to keep working on getting everybody to do that. And we will have a, a cyclist safety campaign coming out this spring as well aimed at cyclists. Okay. Gabe, I, I, you got two more short questions, and I'm, you're doing a great job, by the way. John Wirtz, Jacobs Engineering, when will I be able to divvy, by the way, there's only one V or two Vs in Divi. Two Vs. Hmm. <laughs> when will I be able to Divi to City Club lunches? Yes. Um, you're going to start to see them pop up late, well, mid to late June. 
uh, throughout River North and the Loop, and then expand out there throughout uh, the 32 square miles that I showed earlier. Okay, last question. And I always have to leave the sandbag for last, though, the opening poem. Perhaps someone could classify that as a sandbag. Graham Grady, Shevsky and Froelich. Driving may be down, but is car ownership, off-street parking requirements, should they be adjusted? You know, that's a great question. I don't know if uh, car ownership is down here. I know in Washington, where I came from over a decade, uh, the city started to grow a lot. Uh, later in the 2000s, and car ownership fell. So the city was growing at a rate of 3%, and car ownership fell, uh, car registrations fell by 6%. I think we will see that here, but I don't have the stats here. But we are working with uh, the, the Department of Housing and Economic Development on uh, some changes to the zoning code uh, so that d uh, the developers do not have to build more parking than people actually want. How about a big round of applause? Thank you. Thank you. I hope you take this damn poem. Oh, yeah. Thanks for the poem. <laughs>